The Lord be with you. And also with you. Friends, welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. I'm so glad that you all are here with us. I have a few announcements to lift up today. Uh, first, you'll notice this week we will have our Bible study again. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, 6.30 on Tuesday night or Thursday morning at 10. And we're going to be looking at Genesis chapters 6 and 7. Uh, the story of Noah and the flood. So hopefully that should be uh, an interesting and a fun time. So again, that's this week. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet for the youth group. They are selling uh, T-shirts. Uh, Ann, is there more of you want to <coughs> mention about that? Just a little correction. Sure. May 13th in the bulletin, not April 13th. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, $20. Um, I have not looked at the sign-up sheet yet. Carolyn did it for us. Yeah. To just put your size, again, it's some sort of blue we're coming up with, and just a small logo in the chest. And um, it is a fundraiser, and again, 100% profit for us. Thank you. Um, and then there's also another sign-up sheet. Uh, the uh, Rorix went to the, Bible, the Museum of the Bible up in D.C. It's a new museum, and John was excited. He said he said such a great reviews about it, so much so that uh, we, it sort of inspired us to try and see if we can get a group to go up to D.C. and, uh, and possibly go visit the museum. So there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, right now, the date that we were looking at is June the 7th, so if you can uh, go on that date, please put your name down if you're interested. Uh, we'll probably just carpool up together and head up to maybe Manassas or Alexandria or somewhere in Northern Virginia and take the metro into D.C. But it's just a day trip. We'll leave in the morning, go to the museum, probably get some, some lunch, maybe walk around a little bit and come back. But uh, the, go ahead and take a look at that sign-up sheet on the board. And also this afternoon, the uh, Jefferson <coughs> Society is having their uh, uh, spring concert with Rudder's Requiem uh, at Timberlake United Methodist. Uh, Carolyn is, uh, will be singing, and Betsy is, uh, as well as, I know you all know a lot of other people who are involved in that choir as well. So please come, that's at 4 o'clock uh, again at Timberlake United Methodist. Are there any other announcements? Gary? Yeah. Uh, for anyone who did not get a chance to uh was a nation in for our mission trip last Sunday or this week. Uh, you can still be here today and uh, put on the memo line if you check for the mission trip or in the uh, envelope for mission trip, whatever you need to do. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Sing to our God a new song. God has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Pray for me to join a song and sing praises. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world and its people sing together for joy. Please stand and join us in hymn number 122. Time is the glory.
Friends, this is the good news. Forgiveness is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the fourth chapter of Peter's first letter, verses 12 through 19. Listen now to the good news of Christ. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let not one of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Praise the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we're continuing in our sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. We are nearing the halfway point point of this series, and before we dive into today's article, I wanted to state a reminder concerning the purpose of this series. The Apostles' Creed is something we recite every week, so much so that for many of you, it has been memorized since childhood. Now notice, I said you. While I do have the Apostles' Creed committed to memory, it was not something that I grew up with. In my youth, when asked to confess my faith, or as they called it, give a testimony, I often struggled with finding the right words. There's a lot about faith and life and doctrine that my young mind found it difficult to comprehend. <coughs> When I discovered the Apostles' Creed, I discovered a liberating force. In the Apostles' Creed, I found the words that expressed my faith. But since it was something I did not grow up with, it took some study on my part. It took an effort for me to learn what it is that the Apostles' Creed is saying. What does it mean? To believe in God the Father Almighty? What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? This sermon series came out of a desire to give testimony to the faith of the historic church. I find comfort and hope in attaching my faith to that of the ancients, one that is tried against the annals of history. My hope is that you, too, may find comfort and strength in the words of the Apostles' Creed. So now let us answer the question. What does it mean to believe Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried? The suffering of Christ is at the core of classical Christianity. The fact that the Apostles' Creed jumps from an affirmation of the birth of Christ to a confession of his passion is not an accident. The purpose is to bring into focus the events of Jesus' death. Now this is not to say that Jesus' life was unimportant for the authors of this creed. Quite the contrary. 
The ancient church knew and understood the immense importance of Jesus' life of obedience in the grand plan of salvation. In fact, Jesus' death was the culmination and the fruition of his life and teachings. His suffering, then, is just as much part of this mission as his teaching and his life example. Moreover, Jesus himself expressed a certain compulsion to drink the cup the Father had set before him. He said that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem, knowing the end, what the end might be. He assumed the role of the suffering servant of Israel, who acquainted himself with grief and fully entered into the human predicament. So this is the very thing we proclaim when we confess the Incarnation, that God the Father Almighty emptied himself, or as Calvin likes to say, God condescended to our level to acquaint himself with our humanity. This condescension or suffering was done for our benefit. As Paul says elsewhere, by one man, Adam, sin entered the world. And therefore by another man, Jesus, redemption could be had by all. Suffering then was not something that was left to Jesus and ignored by his followers. Indeed, the opposite is true. As we've seen in our Bible study, the apostles saw reflected in their own suffering and the suffering of their compatriots the same suffering of Christ. Suffering for the early church was not something to flee from, nor something to rationalize, nor something to find masochistic enjoyment in. The consolation of the early church is not denying that suffering, but knowing there is victory over it. This is what Peter is getting at when he says, if anyone suffers at a Christian, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. To confess a faith in Jesus Christ who suffered, we are confessing that in Christ, redemption from ultimate suffering is accomplished through suffering. That is to say, the turmoil of the Christian is but a paper cut when compared to the torments of hell. Now the Apostles' Creed includes a modifier to Jesus' suffering, which was done under Pontius Pilate. Of all the historical personages that surround Jesus' passion, why was Pilate given special consideration by the Creed? Well, in selecting Pilate, the authors of the Creed were not lifting, off, lifting the guilt off the sh uh, shoulders of Judas, Caiaphas, Herod, and the many others who uh, participated in Jesus' crucifixion. Rather, the authors selected Pilate because of his unique function in the historical unfolding of the covenant. You see, Pilate represents the legal authority of the Gentile world. Now, if you remember our study on the atonement, you'll recall that Jesus plays the role of the scapegoat from the Day of Atonement. The scapegoat, after being burdened with the sins of the people, is cast out into the wilderness or banished from the camp. Jesus, as the ultimate scapegoat, has to be tried and judged outside of the camp and delivered to the Gentiles, carrying with him the burden of our sin. By confessing that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, we confess that Jesus became the scapegoat for our transgressions and ultimately for our redemption. Now this Jesus, whom we confess suffered, was crucified. The symbol of the cross has been virtually universal throughout Christian history. 
We see depictions of it in various forms from the earliest decades of the church and even into the furthest reaches of Christendom. Yet the meaning of the cross has not been so universal. Today, we gladly wear the cross around our necks or on our lapels. We display it on our bumpers, in our front lawns, and even tattooed on the body. We wouldn't think twice about buying a rustic or Celtic cross to put it in the living room as a wall hanging. But how many of you would hang on your walls an artistic rendition of an electric chair? How many of you would wear a gold-plated gallows or proudly display a firing squad? Not only would that cause quite a scandal, you'd likely be taken into custody uh, to be examined for mental stability. It's madness to lift up in adoration any form of execution. Yet that's exactly what the Christian does when she kneels at the foot of the cross in prayer. Why is it that the cross, a gruesome implement of death, not only adorns the physical church, but is at the center of her worship space? Well, the reason is because it is such a gruesome implement of death. To locate the answer, we must first locate the cross within the framework of the redemptive history of Israel. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul quotes from a section of Deuteronomy. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The curse, excuse me, the cross is so central to our faith because it represents the curse that burdens our race. When we think of curses today, some may think of words you shouldn't say around your grandmother. Others may think of voodoo witch doctors and their magical hexes. But the biblical concept of the curse is very different. If you remember from our Bible study on Genesis, we looked at from the very beginning, God was relating to his people by way of a covenant. There, God told Adam and Eve that they could eat of any fruit in the garden and have wonderful communion with God, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if they were to eat of it, they would surely die. At its core, a covenant is a simple if-then statement. If you do these things, then everything will be well. If you don't do these things, or if you do things that are contrary, then things will not be well. Or put another way, if you do good, then you will be blessed. If you do bad, then you will be cursed. And as we all know, our ancestors did bad. And from thence on, we have all been cursed with the judgment of death and the separation from the presence of God. Now, on the cross, Jesus was cursed. As Lamb of God, the sin bearer, he was cut off from the presence of God. On the cross, Jesus entered into the ultimate experience of forsakenness on our behalf. The crucifixion of Jesus highlights not only the ghastly and torturous passion of Christ, but also the severing of the relationship between the incarnate Word and God the Father. The cross is so central to our faith because it represents the curse that rightly belongs on our shoulders, but was carried by Christ in our stead. We heard Ron read from the prophecy of the suffering servant of Isaiah. Jesus is that suffering servant, and the cross is the vehicle through which the curse is transferred and by which we receive his benefits. 
The New Testament portrait of Jesus as the incarnate one portrays him as the suffering servant, acting in history to bring about cosmic redemption. This is the very basis of the atonement and the very thing we believe when we confess that Jesus was crucified. Now, if the cross was the vehicle of the curse, then Jesus' death is the manifestation of the curse. Therefore, we confess that not only was he crucified, but was dead. Jesus died. Jesus had to die. Remember the covenant from Genesis chapter 2, you, shall, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That was the covenant from the very beginning. And it is by God's grace and grace alone that Adam and Eve did not succumb to death immediately. For indeed, that was the right and just response for breaking <coughs> the terms and conditions. Paul, too, reminds us that the wages of sin is death. The just and fair judgment of God toward sinning is death. Once we grasp the gravity of sin and its devastating power, then we may gain a better insight into the grace and steadfast love of God. God doesn't have to be gracious toward us. But because he loves us, his very good creation, he stays death's hand and allows us many, many opportunities for reconciliation. And these opportunities at writing our relationship with God are only afforded us because Jesus died. In death, he received judgment. My judgment. Your judgment. The one who was fully obedient was stricken with the judgment of the disobedient. The judgment of the first Adam was transferred to the second Adam. And the life of the second Adam was given up so that the descendants of the first Adam might have eternal life. Because of Christ, when a Christian dies, that death is no longer a payment for sin but rather is a transfer from sin into life eternal. And now we reach a turning point in the Apostles' Creed. Up until this moment, the Creed has taken us down and down into a moment of despair culminating in the death of Jesus Christ. But now, and ironically, the tide changes when he was buried. Jesus' burial has far more significance than we usually give it during Easter. Once Jesus died, a well-to-do secret disciple, Joseph of Arimathea, took Jesus' body and buried him in his own tomb. Now this is a truly extraordinary occurrence for those gathered on that fateful day. Jesus was considered by many to be a common criminal. So much so, he was executed as one. Yet this burial stands in sharp contrast to the customary procedures of the day when dealing with executed criminals. Jesus' body was not dumped unceremoniously, but was treated with honor and respect. In life, the Son of God received no great honor from the religious elite. In those final moments of his ignominy, he was even abandoned by his own disciples. And Jesus himself said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. But in death, he received a burial of dignity befitting any leader of Israel. In death, he was given a luxurious resting place fit for king. So when we confess that Jesus was dead and buried, we are confessing to the end of his humiliation and the beginning 
of his exaltation. Next up is a startling phrase that, for many, has stirred not a few controversies. What does it mean he descended into hell? Well, to find out, you have to join us next week. <laughs> For now, let us pray. Covenant God, every day we ought to ask for your forgiveness. For every day we sin against you. Yes, Lord. Forgive us for our sins of pride, selfishness, idolatry, and distrust. We know that the wage of our sins is death and that because of our sins, we shall surely die. But we are not dismayed. For as your children, you have ordained for us a pathway to eternal life. And that path is covered by the blood of Christ. In his suffering, crucifixion, and death, the punishment of our sins was cast on his shoulders. He and he alone could bear the heavy weight of each of our crosses. We are not dismayed because we know that death has lost its sting. And when we suffer and eventually die, we know we will join our Lord in eternal glory. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, I now invite you to stand and sing the hymn in Christ alone. It is an insert in your bulletin.
<laughs> now I shall profess our faith with the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Offer to God what he has given to us to extend the gospel witness into the world is a discipline of truth. Letting go of our possessions, our time, and even ourselves. Let us be generous in our ministry and missions. We need not fear. We abide in the vine. <laughs>
Chris, West South Carolina. Chris, Chris and Lisa, Lisa. The family of Chris Lisa. Thank you. Yes. All our college students in there. Final projects. Great. So we lift up all our college students who are <laughs> who are doing finals and things. I understand SOLs are probably yeah. still going on. So we certainly lift them. They start for us. They start. Well, we certainly keep all the students and teachers in our prayers as well. Joyce Coleman, as she started her chemo. Yes, we certainly keep Joyce who is starting chemo. Keep her in our prayers. Now let us bring all these prayers to the Lord. <clears throat> oh God, we give you thanks for your Holy Spirit, whose regenerating work continues in us. Through Christ Jesus, you have shown your love for this earth you have made. We pray that all the world may know your power and goodness. Word of life. Reveal the wonder of your world to all people. Show us anew what lives around us, over us, and beneath us. Enliven the church with your spirit that we may bear witness to your creative handiwork. Almighty God, uphold our sisters and brothers who endure disasters caused by weather, war, famine, sickness, or greed. You are our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Encourage us to bear witness to your compassion. Giver of all good things, bring trust and sympathy to the nations of the world. Let peacemakers reign wherever there is conflict. Give wisdom to leaders and hope to the poor. Empower us to live out our faith in every aspect of our life. Wonderful Counselor, we pray for all who are in need of comfort. Help us to stand with those who mourn. Uphold those who are sick. And support those who feel alone. May we be advocates of life and healing. Trusting in your mercy, we commend to you all those whom we have named, those whose needs are known only to you. In the name of your Son, Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now we are bold to pray as Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, friends. I invite you now to stand and sing our final hymn, number 539, Savior again, thy dear name. Be ready.
Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And I, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world, serving you, our Lord, who suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.